This is an ABC podcast. G'day, beloved listeners. Look, I hate starting the week with a grizzle, but I had expected that tonight I'd be able to announce my appointment to the ABC board. I mean, certain promises were made, and uh, but despite being the oldest member, the young Liberals, I've been passed over again. Pretty unhappy about that. Prime Minister. Uh, but we soldier on, as does Laura Tingle, who'll be marking the Prime Minister's homework in just a minute. That's other parts of his homework. Uh, during the drought to pass the time, I started building replica a replica of Stonehenge at the farm, full, full size, full size. And I now discover that I'm just one of a great number of people who've done exactly the same thing. There are hundreds of replicas or parodies of Stonehenge littered around the planet, including a very sizable one in Australia other than my own, which is currently under mouse attack. Those mice will eat anything. So uh, we'll be talking about Clonehenge, which is a marvellous outfit run by a woman called Nancy Wisser, a little later. Then Max Quinn is going to come into the program, driving his huskies before him. Max is a a filmmaker, photographer, and he's done great work up there and down there, you know, at the two poles. And I must ask him whether that means he takes takes Polaroids. Laura Tingle, welcome back. Oh, it's nice to be back, Philip. Much to talk about. Uh, look, as you know, I contact Gough via Ouija board on a pretty regular basis. He's quite astonished by the budget. Are you? <laughs> I think he's probably jealous. Um, look, uh, I'm not astonished in this sense that the really huge expansion in uh, spending obviously happened last year uh, and it sort of ended up sort of creating its own sort of momentum because uh it kick-started the economy and lots of revenue flowed back into the government's coffers. So they did have a choice, of course, though, that they could have cut back on spending um, and uh, and sort of tried to rectify the uh, budgetary ship. But I don't think there was ever any question of doing that, just given the still really precarious nature of the um, of the economy and uh, the brutal politics of getting close to the end of the election cycle. Okay, now, as you know, I am pretty... I'm getting on a bit. I'm well into my octogenarian era. And uh, that makes me not only the ABC's oldest broadcaster, but one of the oldest journalistic hacks in the country. So I take aged care very, very seriously. One of the biggest ticket items was aged care. Uh, uh, It was the biggest ticket item. Um, uh, well, unless you count things that they announced beforehand, which was the the um, the in, the sort of fifty dollar a week increase in um, in the unemployment rate, uh, in the unemployment uh, payment. Um, but uh, look, it was a really uh, comprehensive start to addressing decades of uh, sort of sneaky cutbacks and lack of attention to detail and everything um, g- going right back uh, and and the fact that the uh, aged population is growing exponentially. So um, there's this huge increase in the number of home care packages, which really now are the centrepiece of the way we seek to um, l- look after old people, that um, they can stay in their homes for as long as possible. Uh, and there were uh, there were some incentives to make that system work better, some incentives to make the residential aged care system work better. But I think it says a lot, Philip, that the ten dollars a day per bed um, subsidy that the federal government's going to chuck on top of the existing payment for residential aged care beds, uh, the, the test of whether they whether uh, nursing homes are using that well will be what the quality of the food is like. Which, but, um, but look, hang on, the Royal Commission. Mm. recommended $10 billion per year. 
And I think the budget allocated $18 billion, but over yeah. five years. Yeah, uh, well, um, it did. Now, um, there, are, uh, there are a couple of things there. One of them is uh, the health minister who's got overarching responsibility for this says that the $40 billion was never actually mentioned by the Royal Commission, that this was a figure that other people guesstimated. Now, whether that's right or not, what you have to take into account with the $18 billion is that it's basically impossible to say, uh, OK, we, the aged care system really sucks, we're going to immediately fix it because one of the biggest factors or the biggest factor in making it work better is in, uh, in a workforce that's better trained and better paid. And first of all, you've got to find that workforce and train it. So the numbers of extra places in the system build up gradually. So therefore, the eventual uh, levels of spending that are estimated won't be reached in the first couple of years. So the, you know, there's some explanation there for why the figure isn't as big as the $40 billion that others have estimated it to be. Now, it's impossible to disconnect the budget from the scheduled reopening of the country. No plans announced for that reopening, as I understand. No, quote, no roadmap out of the gilded cage. It's it's really mystifying, Philip. There are some things... Sometimes the Prime Minister does things which you... You sort of just go, well... Or, or the government does things where you go, well, why... This doesn't even seem to be in your political self-interest. But th this became almost immediately the question about the budget. The fact... Not that it was saying, well, on the 1st of June we can all go to Disneyland or something. It was just... But people are becoming much more focused on the fact that opening up the economy again is quite a complicated issue. It's not just a question of letting letting um, letting it all rip. It is a question of uh, setting up um, uh, setting up uh, procedures and protocols for people once they're vaccinated. It's working out what the risk factors are of letting people into the country. It's addressing particular industries that have got um, skill shortages. It's about letting international students in. It's about how do you assess what other countries' capacities are and you know what, you, what requirements you're going to put on people before they travel. And there was just nothing about that in the budget other than this general statement that we, we thought we'd get vac most people vaccinated by the end of the year and um, that the borders would open by about the middle of next year. Now, there was a lot of argy-bargy about that vaccination forecast because, of course, the vaccination program hasn't gone well, uh, but it's sort of a bit irrelevant in a way because at least a quarter of the population, i.e. kids, won't be vaccinated anyway, even if everybody else actually lines up for it. So, you know, we, we won't be... You know, only be seventy five percent of the community would be vaccinated by the end of the year if everybody did get vaccinated. So there are a lot of really different issues to work through. And um Scott Morrison today was starting to talk about that a bit more and saying, well, look, it is complicated, and we've got all these things to think about. And our first aim is to get as many people vaccinated as possible and to then allow them to travel within Australia to areas where there might be a lockdown if they've got vaccination, uh, brackets, just so we can get used to this idea, I guess. We're having a mingle with Tingle, the aura of Laura. Does all this play into his decision about the election date? Oh, I think it does completely. And I think um, it's, it's sort of very political as well because you'll remember how... Um, uh, the states uh, got a bucketing from Canberra last year when they respectively locked down and there was a lot of frustration on the part of the Prime Minister at um, the states locking down because he thought it was holding up the economy and the recovery. Um, so he's decided to sort of do the same thing. So he thinks that the um, the at the moment the, uh, the, the lockdown, the closed, closed borders work for him politically, the budget works for him politically because uh, we're at sort of peak money flowing into the economy. That's going to start fading next year and uh, he's got to make a decision now about whether he goes at some time between roughly August this year and March next year um, to make sure that he's at minimum risk and maximum benefit from the budget of all the various spending measures. Probably the uh, the worst political decision of late has been the the ban on flights from India, but they have resumed. But many passengers have been refused entry because of a positive COVID test. But you raise the point 
that the reliability of the testing system is in question. Well, that's right. Um, some of the people who were uh, knocked off that first flight, uh, turns out they subsequently got negative test results. So um, there's quite a lot of argy-bargy going on today between Qantas and the government about uh, which testing labs they were using because one of the um, testing labs apparently uh, been, had lost its accreditation from one of the Indian authorities last month. So there, these, this sort of shows you in microcosm the sorts of complications you can get that you've got to be a- absolutely confident of the standards that you're applying if you're going to apply such standards. And you've also got to work out what you're going to do in circumstances like uh, the ones we saw over the weekend where apparently the people who uh, had thought they were flying out uh, had come to, um, you know, it, into, I think it was Delhi, I, I, having a senior moment, I can't remember, but I think it was Delhi, and they got to Delhi and then they were told, sorry, you, you're showing up as positive, you can't get on the plane, but they didn't really have anywhere to go. So I think it puts all sorts of new uh, onus on um our, our embassies and high commissions around the world uh, to work out what they're going to do to help people in these sorts of complicated circumstances. And it's fine to say, well, you know, we're, we're not responsible in that sense. I think re- in real in reality they are. And it was interesting that um, there was actually a bit more money in the budget um, for consular services which recognised uh, the, the problems that have been created by COVID. I was going to make the obvious point or echo the point that the rollout is still having a, a few teething problems, although uh, ill-fitting dentures might be a better a better metaphor, but it's pretty dreadful that it the disability be... sector is still, uh, you know, not being oh, Well, the disability sector is a disgrace. I mean, a lot of the other uh, se- sections of the community are starting to roll out at a sort of a much more... Um, you know, serious clip uh, just because the states once again have um, got involved and have got these mass vaccination centres. So that's putting the numbers up. But we saw these really disgraceful numbers revealed today, which basically showed about slightly less than a thousand of a population of about 26,000 people in dis- disabled uh, group homes and the like had, had been vaccinated. And they were in one of the first priority groups that should have been done before everybody else was done. Um, and it's still not at all clear to me why this is the case. You know, there doesn't seem to be any really clear explanation of that. Before I let you go, I was trying to get through to Goff on the Ouija board just before the program to see what he thought of Elbow's response. Didn't make contact. How did Elbow go? Well, it was a speech... I suppose you could say it was a speech for the true believers, uh, Philip. Um, you know, it, it appealed to a lot of... What, to both really, of us? <laughs> it appealed to a lot of traditional sort of labour uh, things. I mean, um, Albo told his uh, log cabin story again. There was stuff in there about social housing. There was some good stuff about um, apprenticeships in uh, renewable energy and um, and those sorts of new energy sources. But... He he said in the speech himself, look, uh, this is a once-in-a-century op- opportunity uh, that's created by this pandemic to transform the economy, but he didn't really have a lot more to say about it than that. Now, Labor people will say to you, there's not much point doing it because uh, nobody's paying any attention. And, in fact, the news poll that was out today, um, apart from showing that it made not one skerrick of real difference to the government or opposition standing. Um, sorry, the budget didn't make a, much of a difference. Um, the number of people who didn't know whether the budget would be make them better or worse off was also incredibly high, which suggests people aren't paying attention. So there may be merit in the Albanese case that um, there's no point, you know, using up all your best ammunition now and it's you might as well wait for the election campaign. But I thought given all of our conversation last week about the fact that the budget was an election budget, you'd be expecting something a bit more in kind back from the opposition leader and it really wasn't there. Laura, how's your uh, Stonehenge replica going? I know you've been working on one as well. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, that immediately made me think of my all-time favourite movie, Philip. Uh, this is Spinal Tap. So um, um, I'm going to have to... I've got, I've got a few little bits of sandstone and <laughs> I think I'm now going to 
do my own Stonehenge, but I'll have to have a listen well, to you, you'll it. You'll have to listen. Hinge? You'll have to listen to Nancy Wisser because I she, will. she knows all about all the Stonehenges, including the one that I'm building in the front garden. Laura Tingle, Chief Political Correspondent for 730. And now, after a little bit of music, it will be my pleasure to introduce you to Nancy Wisser. There are, of course, any number of uh, mysteries about Stonehenge stuck out there in the Salisbury Plain. Uh, those who visit it are often a bit disappointed in that it's not quite as grand as they anticipated, but it is marvellously enigmatic. But even more mysterious is what's going on with Stonehenge. For some reason, across the world, people are building replica, replicas and sculptures of this ancient monument, and so I am not alone. From Slovenia to Spain to Thailand, and even here in Australia, I have some competition. What is it about Stonehenge that prompts people to do this? Now, to find out more, we're joined by Nancy Wisser, who runs Clonehenge. It's a project dedicated to keeping track of all the Stonehenge replicas in the world. And I'm delighted to say that Nancy's online from Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Little Wireless Program, Nancy. Thank you. Hello, Philip. Um, I would like to say I read up a little about you and it's an honor to speak with you. Well, I'm, I'm a sort of an ancient monument too, you see. So <laughs> I have some some affinity. Look, worldwide, there is about a hundred permanent ones. I didn't know that, Nancy. That's true, and most people don't realize it. And depending on your definition of Stonehenge replica, there are quite a few more than that. Um, it's it's funny. The most interesting thing to me is that Stonehenge replicas, even though they're all replicas of the same thing, are wildly divergent, very different from each other. I vaguely remember seeing a wonderful sort of, uh, well, a f an echo of Stonehenge made with motor cars. Do you know that about that yes. one? Yes. Well, which one? <laughs> so there's no, a few I mean, of those. There's one, there? Yes, there's one in Nebraska that's probably the most famous one. Um, and then uh, just recently one appeared, I'm going to say Korea. Um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there have been others. There was one in Canada for a while. And for the Olympics, there was a small one built in London. So there's a spectrum of accuracy, isn't there, in, in Stonehenge replicas from full size and very careful reproductions to little garden varieties. That's right. And then, of course, they're the ones made with celery or something, which <laughs> are, are lots more, less accurate. But yes, uh, people notice different things about Stonehenge, depending on who they are. It's like a Rorschach plot. <laughs> so that <laughs> so that a scientist will see this very precise uh, kind of astronomical observatory and make something with very straight lines, whereas an artist will see it as a sculpture and, and try to imitate the roughness of the stones. <laughs> In introducing the program tonight, I was talking about my efforts to build a, a Stonehenge on the farm and how it's under mouse attack because we're having a huge mouse plague in Australia. But oh. you point out that there are actually Stonehenges made out of cheese. God, they'd be popular. <laughs> yes. Uh, any, any conceivable... Uh, material, especially if it's roughly rectangular, eventually there's a Stonehenge. I mean, sometimes I just, to find new ones, people don't usually, usually send them to me. I do searches to find them. And uh, I can almost count on if a material 
is sometimes in a rectangle that there will be a Stonehenge of it. So I can, you can just uh, Google Stonehenge plus whatever it is. I just found one made of pickled pork <laughs> made in China <laughs> yesterday. Well, I'm looking at photos from your um, excellent efforts and I'm looking at one of your personal favourites, which is, has to be one of the funniest a Stonehenge street sculpture that detects and speaks to visitors. Yes, how wonderful. I I said maybe English Heritage should try that if they want to. Of course, they don't really need to drum up interest anymore. But yes, I mean, you walk up to it, it detects you and starts speaking to you. I think that's on some level brilliant. <laughs> but it's also very voluptuous and white and curvy. It's quite seductive. Oh, I didn't see it that way. I saw it more as kind of a larval Stonehenge from which an adult Stonehenge would eventually emerge. And then there's a very, very serious one in Spain on a bluff, which is a memorial to people killed uh, during Franco's time. Oh, you have become aware of some of my favorites. Yes, uh, that's a beautiful thing. And uh, it has a poem on it dedicated to the people lost, uh, to the regime, and it stands on a bluff, as you said, and they have red paint dripping on it. It's, it's a very moving, moving monument, and it just show, goes to show the, the wide spectrum that Stonehenge replicas represent to people, from the sublime to the ridiculous. But you point out that there's other monuments to people who were victims of war. That That's right. That Stonehenge oh. is often recruited for that purpose. Yes, there's a, uh, for a long time there was a mistaken idea that human sacrifice took place at Stonehenge. It was very uh, Victorian, I think, romantic. To, uh, there's a slab there that when it gets a puddle on it, a kind of red uh, microorganism grows in it and people imagined it was blood and so there was this whole thing. And, and that led to people using the monument to represent the sacrifice that governments made. There's one in Washington state uh, that was really anti-war, although it's not usually uh, described as that now, but it represented the way the government sacrificed the use of America to war. That, that's the one in Washington state? Yes, yes. Mary the, o- the oldest one in the U.S. That's correct, yes. Now, I'm not apart- used to talking to such informed people. <laughs> Look, apart from my efforts at the farm under mouse attack. Yes, I'm very curious about this. You'll have to send me photos. Tell me about what else is going on in Australia. I had no idea that there was a full-size replica in Esperance. Oh, yes. Well, that's one of the most remarkable ones in the world. As a matter of fact, when I had the privilege to go to England and speak with some Stonehenge experts and ask them, uh, what is your favorite Stonehenge replica? One of them cited that one in Esperance as being his favorite because the alignments apparently are perfect and they've gone to great lengths to to make it really an excellent structure. I've, I've heard Australian people who had been to England and seen the real one say that the real one was rubbish, that the Esperance (laughs) one was much better. (laughs) Now, we're talking about a full-size replica, and it appears as the original would have looked around uh, 2000 BC. That's right, except the stones, of course, are very even. It's, you know, I don't, the history of that is that a man named Ross Smith, who apparently at the time was wealthy, commissioned to have those stones cut out of the quarry. But then he went bankrupt. I was following this from Clonehenge the whole time. And for a while, those stones just sat in the quarry. And then um, the Beals eventually bought them and erected them on their farm. So they're sort of heroes to me. I must say that the Stonehenge, well, this one, the Esperance, it looks sharp like a new set of teeth, whereas the one on the Salisbury Plain looks uh, like, you know, it looks like the teeth have gone off, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. I don't think it was ever quite uh, so sharp, as you say. I think the stones were largely rough, 
but it has certainly been affected by the thousands of years that have gone by. And people chipped pieces off it. People broke up the stones and hauled them off to build houses. The one uh, it has taken a lot of abuse, that one out there, and it's amazing it's still there. I think if yeah, well, I that, may, that always happens with monoliths. All the, the, the wonderful ma- white, white limestone that uh, coated the Great Pyramid, for instance, was looted to build, uh, you know, the, the mosques in Cairo. Now, I have to tell you that my executive producer has just Googled and she's found a Stonehenge made out of Tim Tams. This is a very Australian building material. But you see, your appearance on the program is causing widespread, <laughs> widespread uh, excitement. How did you uh, get into this? I know that you were involved in preserving Native American Indian stonework. That's right. And someone ask the question that began to be asked was would it be better for the native american stonework to be known or would it be better to keep it hidden which would keep it safer uh because if it's known there's some people who hate native americans uh or that want to find artifacts and they might take them apart or destroy them purposely but if they weren't known they might be accidentally destroyed in the creation of you know development so They asked me to find out from people in England, and I went on and found a website called the Megalithic Portal, where I found, I have to say, some kindred spirits. Um, And we began joking about Stonehenge and how everything is sort of the Stonehenge of Siberia or the Stonehenge of Africa or the Stonehenge of Brazil or whatever. And uh, we began sending each other. As a joke, any Stonehenge we found on the internet. And uh, he lost interest, the person I was sending him to, but I began to say, this is funny. And that's how it all started. We should point out, of course, that there are hinges all over uh, the UK. I've visited quite, quite a lot in Scotland, for example. Now, are you a druid? No, I'm afraid not. And the big disappointment for a lot of people is as I'm sure you know, Druids had nothing whatsoever to do with Stonehenge. Now, I love the way you talk about this. Scientists built them as astronomical observatories. Artists built them as sculptures. Curiously, few were made by pagans. Large ones, small ones, different proportions with different ideas. And you have been dazzled, haven't you, by the the number and the diversity. That's right. And and by the human spirit that's behind them. I I think for people, Stonehenge is a symbol a lot of times of, you know, the very deep things, timelessness and death and rebirth and mystery. And the wonderful thing about people is they can look at that and then do something playful with it. And for me, I think that's what's kept me at it is again and again, I see human ingenuity, like the car one you mentioned in Nebraska, or I see playfulness where people are sitting at a table eating chips and they suddenly build a Stonehenge. I see a wonderful side of human nature at a time in history when sometimes it's hard to remember there is a wonderful side. (laughs) Well said. Now, tell me briefly the rules of hinginess. Okay. Well, that's, the story behind that is apparently there are hundreds and hundreds of modern stone circles around the world and people wanted me to post them. And I was only doing things that were purposely sto- replicas of Stonehenge. So all the other circles, although I love them, I couldn't include. And people got, this is the internet, people got testy with me. They got angry with me because I wouldn't post their wonderful stone circles. So I made the rules of henginess based on an old website <laughs> called Cute Overload, where she had the rules of cuteness. So um, that was a fun thing I did early on, and it really helped me to kind of ward off a lot of anger from people. You've also got a rating system, Nancy. A what? A rating system. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you, you give it, I know it's nothing to do with druids, but you give it a druid rating out of 10. 
That's right. That's right. And then the only thing that could get 10 is Stonehenge, but it's not a replica, so it doesn't count. Do you, but, do uh, you award them often? I don't so much anymore. Uh, back in the days, Philip, when people had time to actually read uh, a blog post, I posted more on the blog, but people have told me they don't. They just don't have time to go to a blog and read the posts. So now mostly I do really short things on Facebook and Twitter. And I've started one on Instagram where I uh, post a small percentage of the Stonehenges that I find each day. Uh, I don't know if you uh, discovered this, but on the program, when I have a guest who I think is exceptionally interesting, there is an award. And it's not, you know, it's not a Stonehenge sort of award, but it's called the Koala Stamp. There's no physical manifestation, but you have just won a Koala <laughs> Stamp for your wonderful efforts on behalf of hinges everywhere. Well, thank you very much. I'm honoured. I will treasure it. Nancy, thank you for that. Nancy Wisser from Clonehenge. How do we, how do we contact Clonehenge? Uh, the best way is on Twitter or Facebook. Just look up Clonehenge. The one, the Facebook group is called Clonehenge Stonehenge Replicas Unleashed. <laughs> Good on you, Nancy. Nancy was a busy keeping track of all the Stonehenge replicas and parodies around the world. Up next, making films in the very, very cold. When my oldest friend Barry Jones was Minister for Science in the Hawke government, he also had ministerial responsibility for Australia's real estate holdings in the Antarctic. And he brought me a souvenir back from one of his trips. It's called a Ventifact. It's a piece of rock shaped by one thing only, the endless winds that blow across a cold Antarctic desert. Consequently, one side of the stone is rounded and the other is quite sharp, a bit like an aeroplane wing. It gives you one clue as to the extreme nature of working down there, or in most of all, the problems of filming. New Zealander Max Quinn has spent a large part of his 50-year career filming and directing natural history documentaries in the polar regions, both north and south. The stunning films he's made for the National Geographic and the Discovery Channel include Ice Pilots, Expedition Antarctica and Hunting the Ice Whale. He's snowmobiled over crevassed ice to reach uh, remote penguin colonies. He's herded reindeer in Lapland and got up close with white wolves and polar bears and he's also had to figure out how to keep cameras warm in some of the coldest places on the planet. He recently took a break from behind his camera and sat down at a laptop and wrote a memoir called Life of Extremes. I'll hold it up to the microphone so you can see some of its splendid illustrations. And now Max has found time to come on the Little Wireless program and reminisce about his polar adventures. You must be a bit of a venter fact yourself, uh, Max. <laughs> Hello, how are you, Philip? Um, well, I suppose you could say that. I've um, I've stood in some fairly howling blizzards down there in Antarctica, so I know what the effect is. The uh, That stinging snow has over thousands of years been chipping away at the rocks and the dry valleys especially and creating those wonderful shapes of bent by the wind, you know, rocks, archways, that sort of thing. Incredible to see. Now, polar filmmaking, oh, I should point out that Max is talking to us from his uh, very warm home in Dunedin. Uh, polar filmmaking is a niche profession. How did it happen to you? Well, I never thought I would be involved in polar filmmaking, and it actually came to me relatively late in my life. I was actually over 40 when um, I was asked to go to Antarctica, and this is way back in 1991, to make a film about the life cycle of the emperor penguins. And they were looking for 
somebody who was a, a producer, which is what my job was. Uh, but I had camera skills as well, being a previously being a film cameraman. And so they asked me if I would go down there and spend the winter down there, in fact, 11 months in total, um, and make a film about the life cycle of the emperor penguin. Um, at that stage, back in 91, there hadn't been any major films made on Emperor Penguins before. So we were sort of pioneers, really, in that sense. It wasn't until quite some years later that films like March of the Penguins came along. But, um, but yes, we were the, uh, really the, the pioneers to go down and, and try it out. Max, I understand you shot two films at the same time. Yes, well, of course, my company thought that um, if they're going to send me to Antarctica for 11 months, they want to get their money's worth out of me. So um, they asked me to shoot a film about the people who live and work at Scott Basin at McMurdo Station and also to film make the film about the Emperor Penguins. What they didn't realise, of course, was that the Emperor Penguin colony was 85 kilometres away. And, of course, that meant that we had to travel out right the way through the year to the colony at crucial times during their breeding cycle and then come back to film crucial moments in the midwinter cycle at Scott Bay. So uh, it was a bit of a juggling act for us, but we somehow managed to achieve it. Who is Cape Crozier named for? Oh, well, it was actually named after, I believe, the captain of the old ship Erebus, Captain Crozier, and that's who named it. He was the first person to actually see the Cape on the north uh, uh, northeastern tip of Ross Island. We should also, of course, tell the story about uh, Scott of the Antarctic because he's uh, he preceded you there by a couple of years. Yes, well, in actual fact, it was exactly 80 years. He was there in 1911. We were there in 1991. And for us to travel out to Cape Crozier, as three of his team had done way back in the in the winter of 1911, before they went to the went to the, tried to go to the South Pole, um, you know that was a, a, a incredible to be in their footsteps, so to speak, as each time we went out there, especially in the dark of winter, which is when they went out. I understand you'd navigate your way through the winter darkness, feeling for flags on bamboo poles with reflector tape. Yes, well, when, when we got there, we they were flagging a route, 85-kilometre-long um, flagged route, would you believe, uh, that we could follow because we were quite a long way south. Uh, Cape Crozier is 78 degrees south, so in the middle of winter, you get a lot more darkness than you do on the outskirts of the, of the uh, Antarctic uh, continent. So we were going to be in very, very dark conditions, even at midday. And so in order for us to navigate our way safely across crevassed ground, we had to find a safe route, flag that route, and put um, reflector tape on the flag so that our spotlights would pick the reflector tape up. And those flags were about 300 metres apart all the way across the Ross Ice Shelf. But if there was a herbie, as you called a storm, you'd, uh, and they were obscured, you'd need to rely, I guess, on your sat-nav. Yes, well, of course, 1991 sat-nav was pretty uh, early days for sat-navs. Um, we had a sat-nav, which is really the sort of sat-nav you would have in a yacht um, if you were travelling around on the ocean. But I suppose driving over the Ross Ice Shelf was very much the same sensation. Um, so we were, we were able to uh, navigate our way out there. Um, and quite safely too. We had a few little uh, hiccups along the way on some of the trips out there, but generally speaking, pretty safely and, um, and to do our filming at crucial times, uh, which we had already worked out beforehand by looking at the notes that uh, Penguin researchers had done before us um, so that we could make sure that we timed our trips out there at the crucial times of the penguin breeding colony. I'm talking to Max about his extraordinary career down south and to give the listener a sense of how bloody cold it is it gets down to minus 50 degrees celsius if you chuck a cup of boiling water into the air it instantly snap freezes into hail oh my god <laughs> that's exactly what happened we were in our scott base um actually in the restaurant uh, well in the dining room at scott base and they have the big temperature gauge up on the wall and suddenly it flicked over to minus 50. So we qu quickly grabbed a cup of boiling water and went raced outside. We we're even in our T-shirts and we threw the cup of boiling water up in the air and I filmed it. 
and um, and so that was the first time that I'd seen that little trick undertaken. Frank Hurley would be proud of you. I think that's a... <laughs> <laughs> he, now, he would indeed, yeah. Now, emperor penguins are odd in that they're the only penguins that stick around down there. The others uh, tend to move to warmer climes. That's right. There are quite a few species of penguin live in Antarctica, um, chin straps, gentoos, adelies, and emperor penguins. But all of those other species head north. Uh, the adelies right out to the edge of the, the sea ice in the winter, but they all breed during the summer. But somehow the emperor penguin has evolved to breed during the winter. And he's been able to do this by by not defending a territory. All other birds defend a territory. They defend nest sites vigorously, as you probably know, and colonies. But the emperor penguin doesn't. And uh, that's how it's been able to evolve, to adapt to laying eggs in the middle of winter. Instead of having a nest, they have their feet. And of course, they take the eggs up onto their feet and keep the eggs warm with a belly pouch. And they form a huddle. And that's how they can keep warm. And those ones on the inside are very warm. And when the wind blows, they all sort of move around to the sheltered side of the huddle. And the ones on the middle end up <laughs> ending up, end up out on the outskirts of the of the huddle. So it's uh, it's quite a juggling act for the penguins as well. But they they've worked it out and they uh, they survive quite happily down there. So the female, after laying the eggs, goes out to sea and fattens up. Comes back sixty days later gets the chick back from dad and you just you learn that males don't eat from march to august they just live off their body fat yeah that's that's right when they when they go to the penguin colony at the end of summer they're big and fat over 40 kilograms which is pretty big for a bird um and they um and they literally halve their body weight during that time um right the way and through until when the sun returns at the end of august um, which is when the sun returns at that point we were at at 78 degrees south. So um, they they manage to um, yeah just survive and uh, and they eat they eat snow but that's the only thing they eat. And meanwhile the females are, are way 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 out at sea trying to find open water on the sea ice so they can fatten up. And they seem to have it timed pretty well so that they come back to the colony. Uh, just within a few days of that egg being laid, oh, sorry, the egg being uh, hatching on the male's feet, and they claim the chick back off the male. But even even that is remarkable, and you managed to film this because when Mum comes back, she calls out, and they can identify their own chick's voice. Oh yeah, incredible. I mean, the Cape Crozier colony is not a particularly big colony, but it's quite a, a healthy colony. But it's only about a, a thousand adult uh, birds, whereas some of the emperor penguin colonies, um, are, say closer to some of the Australian bases in Antarctica, are quite huge. Uh, might be say thirty thousand birds. But um, that that is quite a small colony. But they do. They come back and they call out and they somehow recognise their voices. And um, and they team, pair up again and exchange the chicks, and then they have a sort of like a, a shuttle service going on. As uh, the males go out, they fatten up, they come back, feed the chick. Then the female goes back out, and she fattens up and comes back. And they do about thirteen of these um, shuttles between the chicks hatching and fledging. Now, I've spent a lifetime in the film industry and I'm well aware of the fragility of film, hence the word, and uh, of the camera. So let's look at how the hell you managed all of this. I take it we're talking sprocketed film. We're not talking digital at that stage. Well, in actual fact... um we were going to shoot it on film. All of the Natural History Unit, the the, uh, the organisation that I work for, um, all of the Natural History Unit's programmes up to that point had been done on film. But the problem we thought about me going down there in the middle of winter was there was no way to get our film back for processing, so we wouldn't see any of the results <laughs> of our endeavours. You couldn't until we get got rushes, back. could you? <laughs> no, we couldn't get rushes, absolutely. So once flights stop at the end of February, they don't start again until the end of August. So what we um, decided was to let's experiment with the latest tape 
videotape technology that was coming out. And so that's what we did. We shot the majority of the film on videotape, on Beta SP, which was the analog videotape format, but very high quality, which uh, Sony a marvel, had come out A marvellous format, absolutely terrific. But Oh, yeah, terrific format. But you would have had to be dealing with uh, pretty early developments in batteries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, those old uh, tape cameras, of course, had moving parts. And when you're in extreme cold conditions like I was in, moving parts don't work so well. So we had to keep that camera warm. And we also had to keep our batteries warm, you know. And we didn't have the lithium batteries which which most filmmakers would use today. Let me ask you a are- personal question, Max. Did you keep it warm with your body fat? <laughs> yes, I did. I was, They made um, the the batteries into sort of like gun belts and I put them around my waist and um, and I had the cable poking out through my jacket and I was able to plug that into the camera. So that's how we kept the batteries warm. So I would go down to the colony with about three of these bulking battery belts around my waist. Um, incidentally, those same battery belts caused us all sorts of issues later on when we were traveling around the world trying to get into the United States in particular because it looked they looked all the world like gun belts. Well, they love guns in America. That should have made you even more welcome. So tell me about some of some of your misadventures. Not everything would have gone to plan. Well, um, in Antarctica that year, we had a few. Um, we had uh, minor ones, really, um, I think. Uh, we had once had a, a situation where we were travelling out in the middle of winter and our van broke down and we were out of radio contact with Scott Bass and uh, we had to somehow get the vehicle going again. Um, and on another occasion, we got lost. So there are a few little incidents like that. Um, but other than that, we had a, a pretty good run. I had a few uh, cases of frost nip and frost, not really frost bite, but frost nip on the ends of my fingers, trying to operate the controls on the camera, which was incidentally covered with a, a cover, which I had made up myself to keep the camera warm and trap the heat in. So, um, you know, we uh, we got through it pretty safely. I, I was um, pretty proud of our efforts, really, when, when you think that probably in this day and age, it's something that wouldn't really be um, allowed, um, if you know what I mean, in our health and safety environment that we work in now. Um, sending somebody off to Antarctica for the, for that length of time um, and travelling out to a colony in the dark of an Antarctic winter, it just uh, probably wouldn't be done now. Now, let's talk about dark and light because uh, you're in a place where there's no more than a faint glow on the horizon. We're talking June. How did the birds react to portable lights being shoved in their faces? Well, that that is interesting because we knew that because we were so far south and it was going to be so dark at this particular colony that we wouldn't be able to do any filming with just the natural light at uh, at midday during the darkest time of the year. So we had to take our own lights down there and literally light the colony. Um, and that was a, a pretty, and that was pretty risky because one thing we did not want to do was disturb those birds in any way because if we did, those eggs would end up on the on the ice and that would be the end of our filming and we would be very embarrassed. So we had to be very very careful. But uh, we worked out a way of doing it and uh, by starting with the lights not pointing out the colony and slowly swinging them around. First of all, onto a, onto a huddle of juveniles which didn't have eggs to try them out on that. And then finally we were able to to um, put the lights onto the main colony and the birds weren't affected by it at all. It's interesting that once those birds laid eggs or had chicks on their feet, they weren't really concerned about anything else except the egg or the chick and uh, because they didn't perceive us as being a threat to them because normally they don't have any predators down there in the middle of winter. So um, they didn't perceive us as being a threat. So we were actually um, they were, we were actually able to get much closer to the birds once they had laid their eggs than before they had laid their eggs. You also witnessed and managed to film uh, some images of violence, a bloody brawl involving a group of uh, delinquent penguins. <laughs> yes, we called them um, unemployed birds. Our birds that didn't breed for any reason, they might have been juveniles or they, um, or they had lost their egg, or, or their partner, or something it may have occurred in their, in their time there. So, and they would want to obviously um, cuddle and mother a, a chick. And so, if a chick jumped off the feet of its parent, um, it would often get set upon by groups of roving juveniles 
uh, like like sort of uh, rogues really um and they would jump on the on the penguin chick and try to snuffle it away and big fights would break out and uh these uh, scientists call this chick napping and uh they um and at one stage they're so intent on on getting hold of that chick that at one stage this great big ruck of penguins came <laughs> just like a rugby scrum really came barreling up and hit it hit my right up against my tripod leg um they, they didn't even realize i was there and uh and it, it can be quite violent and they say there's about a 10 percent mortality rate amongst the penguins uh in an emperor colony uh at this time and this could well be the reason for a lot of the birds um succumbing because uh, it is quite a violent thing, but often the they they're not very good at mothering the the chicks. They don't really know what to do with it, the young birds. So uh, the often the adults would uh, just hang around on the edge of the ruck, and uh, then when they saw their chance, they would rush in and grab the chick back onto their feet again. You make the point that looking back, you feel proud of the small part you played in getting the climate change story across to what was then, and to some extent remains, a rather sceptical public. And you did that north and south. Yes, well, I got the opportunity to do a film, a series of films about the sort of inherent differences between the two poles, one being a, a frozen landmass surrounded by ocean, which is, of course is Antarctica, and the other, the exact opposite, really, a polar opposite, a frozen ocean surrounded by land. And as a result, animals have been able to infiltrate the Arctic, but uh, big animals uh, haven't been able to infiltrate the Antarctic, only birds and penguins and seals, animals that could have swum there. So, um, so that's why Antarctica is so isolated. And we, the whole idea of this series was to sort of tell the story of how the two poles control global climate, like a giant cogs in a, in a global weather machine. And it was a really quite a new concept, really, because up to that point, um, we were actually discouraged from making films about global climate change. Uh, they, they would say to us, no, um, climate change doesn't sell. So... Um, we managed to s sneak an episode of the series in and tell the story of um, of the role that the poles play in, in governing global climate. And this was the time when I first really started to see the changes that were going on, especially up in the Arctic, when I first started to see, for instance, polar bears stranded on land um, or slumping permafrost or on another occasion when I went to Greenland to see the um, the water pouring off the Greenland ice cap. So it was all fairly disturbing. But to actually go out there on location and actually to see it firsthand was a real eye-opener for me. And you're a real eye-opener for us, Max. Thanks for your time. Max Quinn, wildlife documentary maker and author. And, of course, you'll want to read the book. And look at it, lots of pics. A Life of Extremes, The Life and Times of a Polar Filmmaker. And it's out now from Exile Publishing. And there's something about Exile which also seems appropriate to the subject. Good on you, Max. Thank you. Look, come come a bit closer, listener, because I want to tell you something in strict confidence. Tomorrow, Identity Politics with uh, our regular Bruce Shapiro, Edward Rutherford, will explain how 19th century China informs modern China, in particular its relationship to the West. See you then. Listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio, and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.